Hi, this is a very brief presentation of the chess application I made as my solution to the final exercise of the Ruby programming unit in the Odin course. Uh, the exercise is linked in the video description, as is um, the GitHub repository of this code. Um, basically, I followed the instructions and uh, added a few optional extras of my own. The instructions were to make a game playable between two humans that's constrained to legal moves under rules of chess with a secondary aim of being able to save and load an incomplete game and continue the game from the point at which it was saved. Um, all of that I've done and it works. Uh, obviously the first thing we can see is it's got a graphical interface. This was not specified um, so any students who might be watching this, who are approaching this uh, exercise, you don't need to do this. Uh, I found it useful in development and debugging because I could see more clearly what was happening and what was not working. Uh, on the other hand, it added a lot of extra work in terms of creating and managing the elements of the UI. Uh, for example, there's no um, kind of built-in hover functions. Uh, I had to, you know, write that code myself, make sure that the colors, images updated, the tooltips showed in this information box, etc. Um, but the elements of the, the GUI are fairly self-explanatory. There's a to move indicator here, the blue bar, which shows which side is to move. Um, pieces are moved simply by dragging and dropping. Um, we can flip the board um, and play on. Um, so it's white to move. We ha we can use auto flip, which means that it will flip to the side to move. Um, I'm going to turn that off. We can turn the coordinates on and off, which are around the edge of the board here. So I'll turn them back on. We can turn the highlighting of moves off and back on again. So now you can see we can see which moves the green squares this knight has available. Um, load and save game which brings up this menu which I'll explore a bit more later and sound on and off so at the moment it's off and now it's on. Um, new game offer draw resign which is uh, fairly self-explanatory and we've got some buttons down here to navigate moves that have already been played. Um, while we're navigating moves we can't play uh, further moves from this point because that would change the game we can own so for example here we would expect white to be able to move but white can't move but we can play on from the last position so in other words uh, we can't change the moves that have already been made okay so that's uh, the GUI and basically how it works oh we've also got um, a material value here and this will show the differences in material as well as a total for each side. Um, gameplay. The By far the biggest challenge of this exercise is to work out how to constrain the pieces to legal moves. Since this is dependent not only on the type of piece, because different types of pieces have different types of moves, but also um, by some positional considerations, uh, certain uh, um, qualities of positions will limit the moves available to certain pieces and also by whether or not certain pieces have moved. Um, pawns and kings and rooks for example ha may have different moves available whether they have moved or not. Um, let's explain that a bit more clearly. So firstly we have pawns can move forwards um, and they can take diagonally. We have um, knight moves, which is a kind of L shape, bishop moves, which are diagonals, and rook moves, which are orthogonal, horizontal or vertical. Um, and we can see a bit more of that if we give this room to move. Now we can see the rook can move horizontally, vertically. Um, and the last two pieces to show are the king, which can move one square. Uh, it can't move here because of the check from this bishop. So let's give it some room. 
Now it can move here or here because the pawn is blocking the check. And the queen, which can move basically like a bishop and rook combined. Um, lastly, we have the castling move, um, like so. Um, as I was saying, certain pieces, for example, pawns, um, have different moves avail available depending on whether they have moved or not. So before a pawn has moved, on its first move, it, it may well be able to move two squares or one square. However, after it's moved, it's only ever one square. Um, kings and rooks um, kind of need to know whether they have moved. In, in other words, within the piece instance, I record a variable that, that changes when they first move because um, this is important for castling. So this king can castle because neither the rook nor the king have already moved. If I move this rook and then move it back so it's in the position where it looks like it can castle, castling is no longer available because that rook has already moved. Um, okay, that all works as intended. Once we've got the basic moves down, um, and I'll say a little bit about how, that, how I approached that. Basically, I started with um, a parent class of piece, which contains within it the basic orthogonal step, so one step horizontally or vertically, and also uh, a method for diagonal step um, in any one of the four directions that are possible. Um, and this does, for example, things like um, detects whether it's met an edge of the board and prevents the move from continuing off the board, etc. The next um, kind of hierarchy down below the parent class of piece is sliding piece, which is basically for bishops, rooks and queens, which will use a number of um, steps in either orthogonal or uh, diagonal directions or often we'll be able to do that. Um, so all pieces inherit from the parent class piece and some pieces also inherit from the intermediary class sliding piece. Um, and once each piece instance has the ability to find its possible legal moves were there no other constraints due to position um, or checks or pins and I will explain pins for those who are not familiar. Um, then we move on to considering checks. And obviously, the best place to locate an assessment of checks is within the king piece. Um, basically, after every move, the king of the side to move will look for uh, checks. Now, in this position, there are no checks. Let's, let's move on a little bit. Um, Okay, now the black king is in check, and the black king knows, in inverted commas, that it's in check because it looks along all diagonals and all horizontals and verticals for enemy pieces that may be putting it in check. And it finds a bishop here, and it knows that it's in check because there's nothing in between it and the bishop. And this basically means that the king must either move to a square that's not in check, which would need assessing that square for check again, um, or block the check. And this is where we begin to see pins coming in as well. So for example, this bishop would normally be able to move all the way along this diagonal were the king not in check. But now it only has this square available. This knight cannot move at all because it does not block check. So let's move the bishop. Okay, the bishop is now blocking the check and white can now move. This bishop now is limited to only to these two squares to move because if it moves here it's now allowing, it's it's enabling a check and this is what uh, being pinned means. So this piece is pinned. 
So after every move, we use the method within the king to look for checks, but also to look for these kinds of situations. So it, it moves along this diagonal, records the fact that it's found its own piece here and what piece it is, and then moves further along the diagonal and ascertains that this bishop would be putting it in check were this piece not here. Therefore, it knows that this piece is limited to staying where it is or moving towards the piece or capturing the piece that would give check were this piece not here. Um, so basically, after every move, all of that needs calculating for every piece that could give the king check were it uh, were the piece not there. These these are the pinned pieces. So basically, there's a lot of um, filtering and uh, assessing that goes on when a piece is lifted to be moved to ascertain what legal moves it has, if any. Um, yeah, I think that's about as much as I'm going to say about that. It's a little bit more complicated for students who are approaching this. Uh, I'd just say it's a little bit more complicated than even that because one also has to consider things like if the king moves, what squares can it move to? One also has to consider um, whether any of the squares um, that the king may move across or to when castling are in check, then castling is not an option, etc. And really, if you're a student approaching this and you don't play chess, uh, good luck. This is going to be really, really hard because you're going to have to first learn how to play chess before you can approach this this uh, exercise. Okay, so all of that, eventually I got to work. It wasn't easy, but uh, I, I really did quite enjoy working that out. Once I developed the uh, method for detecting checks and assessing a position for checks and pins, uh, it actually wasn't very difficult to work out things like um, detecting checkmate. In other words, the king is in check, but there is no legal move for that side which will um, break the check or end the check. And I can show that very easily here um, by making black play very badly. Uh, for example, this. Now we have checkmate and black cannot move, the game is ended. And this has now been auto-saved, uh, by the way, as a complete game rather than an incomplete game. Uh, I'll use a similar method to detect stalemate, which is where the king is not in check, but there ha there is no move for the side to move that does not result in check. This is a draw by stalemate. This is also enforced. The only other um, result that's enforced is a draw by insufficient material, which is a little bit too complicated to go into right here. Um, I kind of enforce the simplest, clearest versions of this. There are much more complicated versions that I don't enforce that in a real game would require a player to claim um, the draw in any case. It wouldn't automatically be enforced. Um, other draws, uh, like a draw by repetition of the same position three times, will be offered as advice. Uh, I can give an example here very quickly. So this is a threefold repetition of the same position, which can be claimed as a draw. And if I click here, the, the game will end and the result will be half-half, a draw. Or it can be ignored and we can uh, black can play on, uh, which is pretty much as it would be in a, in a tournament game of chess. The same thing happens for the 50-move draw, uh, rule draw, which again, I won't explain. Um, you can research it if you're doing this exercise. Um, so results are enforced as well, uh, as much as they should be. One last thing to mention is um, en passant is also a thing, as it should be. So um, here, if this pawn tries to move past the white pawn using its two-move uh, ability, white will have the ability to take en passant. Um, now that will only exist for the first move um, it exists for. It only, it only exists for one move. So it's available now, 
to this white pawn, but if white plays something else, it's now not available to this pawn. Now I notice a lot of students had problems with that and I can see why. Um, there's quite a lot of conditional logic going on there and also when the pawn does take, it's taking a piece that isn't on the square that it um, goes to. And this is unlike any other taking move. So I can understand why this caused students problems. Uh, it just takes a little bit of extra um, kind of work and finesse with conditionals. The kind of last important element was saving and loading. Now we can see here that we've been playing a game. Um, if I start a new game, we'll see that auto save is on. And we'll play one move. Um, if we go to load save, and we choose incomplete game, the last or the, the top item here will be the current game. So let's load that. And yeah, it looks exactly the same. This was auto saved and we can play on. Now, if we go back to loading complete game, now this game will be the game we were playing two games ago, if you like. And there it is. Um, and once again, we can continue playing from this point. So that works fine. I, I chose to implement an auto save option which can be turned off and then games can be manual saved. Basically so that if you're playing a game against someone and then the uh, application is closed, the game has already been saved. Um, and basically this is saving the game to file, to it's saving all the, the relevant data to a YAML file. And then every move that's made, the most recent saved file is deleted and a new save is created. Um, I was quite impressed by how quickly this, this happens so it doesn't really interfere with gameplay at all. Um, and I think that's more than enough to present the application. Um, take a look at the uh, readme on GitHub for a little bit more information um, or hit me with a message if you if you know you have any questions or you're getting stuck on this or if I can help in any way. Thanks very much for watching.